We are very honored to have Nadja here with us, who is an acclaimed, uh, you know, poet, author, uh, and writer, scholar, teacher. We're just very, very thrilled to have her here. We do want to remind people that this event is being recorded and that it is sponsored by the African American Student Association, the DEI Office, and Student Life. And I also, I just want to share that I do have a copy of not just book here that she co-authored and every special little person uh, in my life got this for Christmas last year. So thank you very much for helping out with Christ Christmas gifts. To introduce Nadja, we will have Day, who is one of our presidents of ASA. So Day, take it away and then uh, Nadja will present to us. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hope everybody's having a great Thursday. I have the utmost pleasure to present our speaker today. Uh, she has always loved school and has used her writing and performance skill in school setting since she was a young girl. She performed speeches and poetry in competition in junior high and continue with jazz core choir and public speaking through high school. Naja began going to open mic readings in college in 2006 and began performing poetry semi-competitively in 2010. In 2013, she began teaching secondary language art in public schools. She started at Oklahoma City, then spent three years at Millwood and is now in Putnam City. She has taught grade seven, 10, 11, and 12, as well as creative writing and the AVID elective. In 2014, Nadja self-published her first poetry book titled, The Risk to Bloom. In February, 2021, she published her first ch children's book with Quraysh Ali Lensana titled, Opal's Greenwood Oasis through the Koliop group. Nigeria is, is pursuing a master of art in literature. She writes on commission, edits by contracts and performs and speaks when and where she is asked. You can find photo, code and poem in progress on her social media. She's active on Instagram and Facebook as well as on her website, which is www.najahama.com. And that's spelled N-A-J-A-H-A-M-A. -A -A. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow students and officer, it's with the greatest honor and pleasure that I introduce Mrs. Naja Amatula Hilton as our speaker this evening. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. I super appreciate the introduction and thank you so, so much. If you don't mind, I have this intro that I do. If you are a praying person, join me. If you're not, ignore me for 45 seconds and then check back in. May the God of water baptize you so the flames won't hurt May the God of earth hold you steady and camp around you and keep you safe. May the God of ether spark your image to move and create. May the God of wind whisper love that never settles. And may this tongue of fire ignite, cleanse, consume, and refine. May my marrow be briefly soothed. Como en el cielo, así también en la tierra. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I am so excited to be here. I'm excited to spend a little time talking about my process and my journey. Uh, as outlined in my bio, this type of work is the type of work that I've been doing my whole life. I don't have um, like this isn't a second career, it's not a hobby, like words are the thing that I do. And I remember when I was in high school and I was studying um, the the writers, specifically the transcendentalists um, in my junior and senior year. And 
and they had the phrase living by the pen right and i remember thinking oh that that sounds so cool and i'm not gonna lie to you it's not as cool as it sounds because it's very hard work but it is what i do and i knew that that's what i wanted kind of from from early on um teaching and the literary arts are very much in my blood so my grandmother has a degree in well my mother worked in, in social work my father was an artist though he was a visual artist and a poet and a writer um my grandmother has a degree in vocal music but she never worked a nine to five she was a homemaker but the times that she did work part-time it was as a substitute teacher um and then my aunt is a teacher my cousin is a teacher i have another cousin on the other side on the other side of the family the other branch of the family who's a teacher and uh my grandmother's father was a teacher and a principal so that is that's the work that my family does but in addition to education po like not poetry but what I call the spoken arts or the literary arts or the 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 gift of gab, if you want to call it that, is is also in my blood. I have a long line of preachers. And so regardless of whether you are a Christian or not, there's a long history, especially in black culture, of the oratory skills that come with being um, a black preacher or that come with being a, a preacher in general. Um, and I definitely attribute my public speaking, my spoken word performance art to, to those that literary history as well. I consider that all to be literary history. And if we track that back to Africa, we've got the 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 Jaili or the Griots um, and their their storytelling tradition to take that all back to so in terms of my writing process i think that that the combination of what i naturally the the nature nurture debate is the ongoing debate chicken versus egg that will never answer but in addition to it being in my blood which i firmly believe it's also been trained into me from the beginning so from strong phonics education from being read to all the time from being in church all the time and listening to speakers all the time and and hearing stories and poems from writing and reading at an early age I have a very firm grasp on the writing process and on grammar structure, and all of that helps me with my poetry as well. So in Oklahoma City, we had for maybe a four year run, we had a group of people called um, the Short Order Poets, and it was a, a group of friends of mine, actually my, my co-author for Opal, uh, Kareish Ali Lansana. I met him, who, if you've been around this group for a while, you've heard him speak at this this uh, presentation before. So he and I met in 2015 when he put out a previous book called A, group, a Gift from Greensboro, of Greensboro, from Greensboro. And he put that book out through a Oklahoma City-based publishing house called Penny Candy Books and the oklahoma city face of penny candy books is chad reynolds and so chad is uh also a person who does short order poems so chad and his friend tim and tim does some poetry work at ou um chad and tim were like we like writing poems and i think all of them and q i think they all met at um at MFA program, if I'm not mistaken, or at least two of them met at MFA program. So they were like, we like writing poems. We want to do some community based work. And we used to have a street festival in Oklahoma City called H and H. Uh, and Chad was really interested in 
typewriter typewriter work and like live work so y'all know short order cook is like you kind of like waffle house you yell out to them you know i want bacon and eggs and they're like, bacon and eggs and they cook it up right there in front of you and they send it out to you so short order poems is like hey i want a poem about bacon and eggs <laughs> and you're like okay i will type you a poem about bacon and eggs and whether or not they're really about bacon and eggs that's exactly what they did so tim and chad collected five or six typewriters and they would find poets from the community i did it with them six or seven times um and and they've worked with all the major poets in oklahoma city and and traveling ones as well and and you would go and sit for two or three hours and people would come up and they would pay 10 bucks and you would write a poem they would go away for 20 minutes they would say i want a poem about love i want a poem about whatever and they would go away for 20 or 30 minutes and you would sit and you would write their poem about whatever and if you're like oh my gosh that sounds so hard it is and it's not um because extemporaneous training um is is a big part of the writing community um the spoken word community the theater drama community and so um I think for me, that's where that came from. And so I love that part of it. And I think that that is a skill that I always had that I hadn't been able to hone until they did short order poems. And I was like, oh, I can actually do this. So for, for my process, I work equally in inspiration, like, oh, I really enjoy this topic and this is a topic that I am passionate about, I want to write about the, you know, if you, if you like the phrase, the muse descends and, and I'm inspired to write about this thing. Also though, because I live by my pen, because I'm essentially a trained writer and because I, it's my business, it's my job, I, have the skills in my arsenal. And I believe that anyone can have the skills in their arsenal to do it more extemporaneously with practice, right? It just takes vocabulary knowledge. Um, so I also believe that the writing process that we teach in university and comp as well as in secondary and in in your writing class your grammar class your english class i think that's helps me too the idea of okay what's my thesis what's the what's the point of the poem what's the point of the whatever book essay and then how do i want to arrive at my thesis right so instead of a rhetorical analysis of logos pathos ethos how do i want to convince my reader to agree with me in this essay it's more of a it's probably still logos pathos ethos in fact i did a i did a presentation on that for tim and and craig hill at the uh, at ou last year where i talked about that in poetry um which literary device do I want to use to draw my reader into the poem? Do I want to rely on imagery? That's one that I do rely on a lot. Do I want to rely on rhyme? Rappers rely on rhyme a lot. Some rappers rely too much on rhyme and not on anything else. Do I want to employ theme um, heavily or not heavily? I I will personally say everybody's everybody's got a um, stance. Nobody has to agree with me. I will personally say I think that too many poets avoid having a theme. I yes, there is the beautiful beauty of language, and language can be beautiful. But I also think that you can be beautiful and have a point at the same time, <laughs> and so. Um, do I want to rely on imagery? Do I want to rely on theme? Do I want to rely on rhyme? Do I want to rely on metaphor? I, my early work more so than my later work uh, relies a lot on the extended metaphor on, on a poem that, that takes, it's not, it's not a two line or a three line metaphor. It's a 
two page metaphor. I have one called crash test semi and, and that's what it's about. It's, <laughs> but it's a metaphor for, it's a metaphor for love um, and, and kind of like reckless abandon love, right? Um, and so these are all the tools that can be used to, to make your point. And so I think as an educator, this is a thing that I think about a lot because teenagers, not just teenagers, people in general, but specifically teenagers are mystified by poetry. And they're like, why it's, it's just so, I don't know what you're talking about. Which is why, which is why I'm big on the theme. Make your poetry have a point so that so that people can say what you're talking about, right? Um, be be beautiful in your language and also have a point. Um, and to that end, to that end, I think that I'm sorry, I was speaking too fast and I lost my train. Oh, I was I was talking about the. Um, the the process of 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 writing and teaching and oh demystifying right so people people think it's too hard and the reason it's too hard is because we don't get into the why of it we we feel like poetry is this thing that just falls down out of the sky it's like and the the poet like the the muse descends that phrase from greek whatever we, we're, we're not worried about them. We don't care about them. But like that ideology has filtered down even now to like right now. I'm in the middle of if you if you want to follow me on the social medias, um, I'm in a big thing because I'm supposed to be doing a poetry unit right now, and I have two other people on my team who are like, eh. Well, one of them is a first year teacher. The other one is not a first year teacher, and he's like, I've just never been good at teaching poetry, and I've heard that phrase so many times over the last nine years because you know owed to a grecian urn and it's like okay but but why but why <laughs> and there's so much of that throughout the years that people have some people have kind of just given up on it and then we've got hip-hop over here and people are like but that's not real poetry and we've got this bifurcation and some of that bifurcation has a lot to do with anti-blackness um and we have just lost the fact that two things can happen at the same time the beauty of words and the point they can both live together that is they they don't have to be separate whoever told us that they have to be separate lied and we don't have to believe them <laughs> so my process is twofold. I love teaching workshops because I love demystifying the process for people. Like, which way do you want to learn? Do you want to do it grammatically? Pick a noun, pick a verb, pick three adjectives, and let's use that as your prompt and let's keep going. Oh, wait, you've got a poem. What? That's a poem? Yes, that's a poem. It was, see, that was easy. But it doesn't rhyme. It doesn't have to. <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, pick an image, pick, pick a central image, take that image, turn that image into a metaphor. It's not as up in the sky as people have portrayed it to be. And I think that that, that portrayal of poetry has, has created this barrier between poetry and regular people. And I think hip hop tried to pull that barrier down and respectability politics and the white gaze was like nope and uh so yeah i'm going to talk about that more as i get into some poems if you have any questions that you like just don't want to forget i don't mind you putting them in the chat um depending on what they are i might answer them right now or i will wait till the end to answer them but i would also be fine with you just putting them there so you don't forget them i am going to read one first that is called belong just to tell you where I belong. <laughs> um, titles are not my favorite thing. I won't, I won't lie to you. I, if I have a weakness in poetry, it, it's the titles, it's the titles. I belong to the healers, to the big mamas whose hugs are transformation, 
to the aunties with x-ray vision whose warnings are sunbeams through storm clouds, rare and necessary. I belong to healers when faith is an ever stocked kitchen, a babysitter, healing is food that sticks to the soul, not the bones, the first full night's sleep in weeks. I belong to the healers, poets who don't rhyme right, whose words are water, balm, a swift swat on the backside to the writers of think pieces who aren't afraid of change and retraction. I belong to the healers, the teachers who don't accept excuses, who are physical therapists of the mind, showing us how to safely exercise what hurts, exorcise unreasonable voices, and rehabilitate thought, build again, a home of habitual cognition. Give me one second to cough. That was also the end of the poem. So you see, there's a theme there, right? I belong to the, that, that explains also my uh, stance on my role in education and poetry in, in this world. So it's Black History Month. If you decide to follow me on the socials, if you're that, that type of person. Um, what I'm also upset about right now is that I have all this work about Tulsa and the Tulsa Race Massacre and I have poems about the Tulsa Race Massacre. Uh, affiliates, friends of mine and Q's wrote a whole album. It's a great album about the Tulsa Race Massacre. And um, we then wrote a curriculum about it. And because of the politics of where we are, I for the first time in nine years, am actually nervous to teach it. Nobody actually told me I can't teach it. Um, I just, for the first time, am in a school. Thank you, Ramona. For the first time in a school, I am. I'm in a mixed school. I've been in predominantly black schools for all well for eight of the other nine years, and. So now I'm like, well, what if that one person or, or three or five, because I have several non-Black students now, um, what if they report me? Because it matters more now. It used to be, I would just have to talk, you know, it'd be a conference, you know, between that student and their parents and the administrator, but now it's bigger than that. So Black history is actually a theme of my work and my life, um, as, as can be seen in Opal and in my other published work. Um, I think this was in my bio, but if it wasn't, it's in the long version of my bio. Uh, I have an album called, well, it's not my album, it's JB's album, called in the Black Future, There's a Place So Dangerously Absurd, long title, short title, Black Future. Um, JB is a rapper, I don't know if y'all know him. And he and I, he's a rapper and an activist. He likes to make sure I always say activist too, I don't just rap, and a business owner. He just opened Eat Side Pizza House. So if y'all come to OKC, make sure you go down 23rd Street and go to Eat Side, East Side Pizza House. Um, so in 2015, we put, put out Black Future because of the poem that I will read you in a moment. Um, and we were talking about, Black history is a theme of his life as well. We were talking about just like, where do we go from here? And if you think about 2015, re remember things that are happening politically then, right? This is only a couple of years after Trayvon Martin. This is before the Black Lives Matter movement has ramped up big. This is very beginning stages of this, right? This is Sandra Bland, this is before we know very clearly that it's a pattern, right? This is when we're just getting the glimpses of like, is this happening everywhere? Is this happening all the time? What's going on? Is this an isolated case? Um, and there was a campaign 
I'm trying to remember which news outlet it was, but I can't remember. One of the news news websites, instead of doing Black History Month, I mean, yes, it was Black History Month themed, but instead of their articles or whatever, focusing on figures in Black history, they said, we're going to call it Black Future Month this time. And all of their articles were about what what can the future hold for this topic? And they talked about reproductive justice. They talked about housing. They talked about uh, the the ongoing issues with, with HIV AIDS. They talked about um, queer identities. They talked about all the things, incarceration. They talked about housing. Did I say that? Anyway, it was enlightening. So I actually pulled, just to juxtapose how I wasn't afraid then, I pulled all those articles and my sophomores that year read so much stuff politically that like they probably had never heard of before and like I was like what do y'all think about this what are, did y'all even know this was a thing we did a bunch of research that year and we read a lot about a lot LeBron was kneeling at the at the all-star game I think it was and so JB and I were like we don't want to do Black History Month the same way it's always been done not that history is not important history is hugely important what does history mean though for the future and what does our future look like in fact that year specifically several people were like what even is the black future if they're going to keep killing us at this rate right so my career arc kind of or the themes of my work can kind of be um put into the categories of black history or the hashtag that I have right now on the social media that I will read a little bit from is this present blackness and then black future. And everything that I do kind of falls into one of those categories. And obviously black future encompasses the whole idea of um, education. Without education, the black future is really dim, right? In order to have a more successful or a more bright, a brighter Black future, we have to do something with education. So I am going to read several poems for you, or at least some snippets of some poems. Um, I might probably not say too much more and just read poems unless something else happens. And feel free to put comments and things in the chat as well as I will stop reading poems in 15 minutes so that you can ask me even more questions um the first poem is about is is the poem from the album the poem that that became the basis of the album go to go to itunes put it put it on there jb doesn't talk about it anymore because he's like three albums past that but it's my favorite thing that i love to talk about um and i'm gonna read that one uh i'll say this after i read the poem so this is in the black future in a latinagra english teacher's version of the future black people's verbs and nouns can agree perfectly and no one will say they talk white grammar proficiency can be the norm code switching is more natural than changing clothes bilingual or trilingual black people need not be a scarcity the linguistic structure of the hookah lounge and the homies couch doesn't need to make us incapable of speaking standard English to those race far from our neighborhood streets. In the black future, there's a place so dangerously absurd that words reemerge as our tools and our friends rather than the means by which the man condemns us to ignorance. I'm not saying that my rapper friend JB and my student Thai priest should prefer the pages of Baldwin and Adichie to YouTube, SoundCloud, and IG, but if we ever want to return to our former glory where we also were seen as worthy of the dominant culture's highest accolades and goals, we must readily decode sentences that don't fit in the 140 characters without needing to ask Siri what the words mean. We've got to stop dumbing ourselves down and calling it resistance. We've got to stop equating selling out with intelligence. 60 years ago, the average black college grad knew the hot new beats and tones of Gillespie, Davis, and Holiday, as well as the free verse of Hughes. They could analyze themes in Othello, Tennyson, and Whitman before dancing the latest jerk or Watusi. They rolled out of bed Saturday morning, hung over from last night's homemade whiskey, and went to sweat it out in a game of street ball on the yard. 
now we think expertise needs to be one dimensional in the black future we remember to believe in renaissance and being good at everything in the black future we cease cleaning our plates like slaves who worry about our next meal better yet we no longer fill them up with poverty mentality carbs grease and swine we know there is greater pleasure than a food coma blood flows through our arteries as freely as wind through an expensive weave we still have the muscles that make us jump higher, the speed that lines the pockets of the league's pale-skinned CEOs, but we aren't afraid to eat vegetables or sweat out our perms, and that makes us old as well as healthy. In the Black future, there are no more excuses disguised as crutches or exemptions. We look at the world that hates us, the parents who made us, and we get up on time for class anyway. We flip off the oppression that plagues us, chant prayers for those falling down in the way of us, and we hug each other anyway. We nod at our Southern neighbors, wave to our Eastern culture pavers, blow kisses to our Pacific populace, and thank the originators of this space for not treating us like the enslavers and we raise our fists together anyway. In the Black future, we see today through tomorrow colored lenses because progress rarely puts out for those who feed it. We give more than requested, work harder than required, and believe in the unrealistic because we matter. And our babies, even more than our own bodies, will depend on this. So, about that poem, I want to say that I wrote it in 2015. And while I love it, it will always be dear to me. And I feel all the same things that I felt when I wrote it. Thank you. Um, I know that some people here, they probably did in 2015 and even more so in 2022, I hear meritocracy there. I hear model minority there. I hear performing for the white gaze there. And I, as a, as a person, I feel convicted to just take all of that into my body because that's who black people have been in this country the whole time right we are not only capable of anything there's not only the ability to to play sports there's not only the ability to be good at the arts there is also the ability to be business owners and the ability to be intellectuals so do I think that we have to traumatize our kids into getting straight A's? No. Do I think that we disserve our kids by not pushing them perhaps harder than they would like to be pushed? Yes, right? Because we can. We can just like everybody else can. And I know that we can because I've watched us. I know that we can because that is what my study of history has shown us. If our ancestors did it, there is no reason why we can't. We are not of a different stock than they were. And that's what that poem still says to me, right? The Black history to the Black future, we are still who they were. We're not different. We haven't changed. Society has changed, technology has made us lazy. Food's gotten grosser and less nourishing, but we're not different, right? So I just wanna take us back to being good at everything, okay? Um, so if that, if that hits you as like meritocratous, also just remember that like, I love hip hop. And if you follow me, um, if you follow me on the, on the socials, you will see that, uh, my education presentation is not my only presentation. Okay. Like I'm a, I'm a real person when I'm not at work. <laughs> so, um, what I'm doing right now is called this present blackness. I'm just going to read you one of those. If you find the, the hashtag on, um, Instagram and I use my short order poem skills for that. Um, I was in a photo shoot 
for Tiffany McKnight, who is an, uh, an artist here in OKC. Uh, and I wrote this right before I went to do a fitting for that photo shoot. So this one's real short. Inspired by aesthetics, flame fanned by friend fans, cold wind whistling through seams, cooling down fire dreams, inspired by work ethics, sparks doused by lying official mouths, by fearful lashing hands that point and report and withdraw when they ought to form circles of salt and build walls of papa's and auntie's wisdom mix with what's good on the line connectivity and vibes this present black me right um <laughs> these are fun uh i'll do this one i was gonna do both but i want to leave some time for some of my history ones um also short um i used to i obviously hanging around jb all the time so i used to spend like every friday and saturday night at hip-hop shows back before i had a kid back when i was young um and so <laughs> I used to be like, okay, okay, okay. Um, I can hang with y'all. I can rap too. I'm a poet. I can rap. Come on. I can rap. I can't. I mean, I can, I can rap along to them, but I can't like rap rap. So I have a cadence that I can do in poetry that like, this is my cool cadence. And so I laugh with them and they laugh with me and be like, oh, Nadja got a cool voice line now. So this is one of those, <laughs> this is one of those poems. This one's called Buy Me Books. I don't like people, buy me books. Or I only like people who write books, people whose life books, whose struggle look like art, who tear apart notepads, rip through beats. I only pay attention to pens, pencils, and sheets. I only care for mics, stages, and fleek people like people I need front row tickets to see, people like me with no home, just a binding. All the scriptures wrapped up to bind me to humans who don't like me, but who write me love, write me beautiful, write me always here for you, write me, trying to find me. Sunglasses so the BS don't blind me, trying to give me so you can get you, become one of those people I don't like, don't like me. Just use me as a path to the cross, a laugh for the lost, a cast for broken hearts, so you know so you grow so you can live through whatever techno lens is the biz when you know who you is before you're too old to impress the critics yeah that's my cool voice thanks you're welcome um <laughs> and so place-based history is something that i've been on for a while um i have several poems like this i think i'm going to give you like a couple of stanzas of each not because they're not important but because i really want to read the resistance anthem and i want to end on that and i want to give it the time that it deserves um green streets actually you know what i'm going to skip green streets only because it is on my link tree on my instagram so if you want to read that go for it that is probably one of my more popular ones at the moment just because the centennial massacre year was last year so I'm gonna read a little bit of this one called TLC for Tatums. Tatums is another uh, historically black town that is unpopulated now and, and, and most people don't know about in Oklahoma. This is an ode to the earth that made us, the ancestors who shaped us and gave us the choice to forgive them, for, to forget them, I'm sorry. Driving one hour south and 17 miles west on an afternoon when I feel a little guilty. I look into trees, knowing they are not always this bare, sensing in my DNA that they bloom bright as sunshine in springtime. They, like me, are taking a break from the stress and strain of teaching the next generation to value what they cannot see. I, like the mothers and fathers who stayed when leaving was said to be progressive, fight a war on two fronts, split my body in half, one hand, 12 ribs, one lung and one calf on each side, my heart suspended between. I'm gonna skip to the end. We've been doing so much with so little for so long, we are now qualified to do anything with nothing. You are a creator, a pioneer, as I drive away from a pink sky evening, I wonder if my actions have any meaning. My conscience is almost screaming, we are black gold. Don't let them erase us. Don't let our history be thrown out like the last film role of our silent movie when someone's great grandbaby had no idea we were still useful. Tell our story. 
keep us relevant. Put your money and your mouth where your heart should be home. Realize that we are more important than your sneakers, cars, and clothes. That's all those people know. Remember that you are better than the box they've placed you in. TLC for Tatums. Here's a couple of lines of one called Land That Rumbles. This one is also on my Instagram if you want to hear more of it. This is our land that rumbles. The rest is death and death alone. One last step up, then step forth. Damn, this feel like rolling dice. They not even from here. Orange don't know red. Smog don't see sunset. Ocean feel boxed in by earth. Don't matter. Can't live by they rules. North air crush our lungs. South heat melt our feet. King sword break my arm. Die under arrogant armor. Need hawk feathers and scissor tail wings. Fix eyes on horizon clean. Collapse into your bones. Bind muscles tornado tight. Breathe the bluest sky. Blue breath balloon. Breathe before you move your feet. Eyes don't see enemy, ears don't hear no roar. Mark space for fortress in home hostile territory. Nothing but brother back to back. No aid, no acceptance, no praise. Damn, this felt like rolling dice. All right, this is the last one. And then I cannot wait to hear your questions and to read up on the comments that I see there. This is called Resistance Anthem. Your presence here is a blessing. Anywhere we gather is a celebration. We make endless party anthems because the joy of resistance is the system we created. Every day we mourn and we dance. The human trafficker did not whip the drumbeat out of our forefathers and we will not show them, we will prove it to ourselves in a twerk, in a whine, in a heel toe, in a line, in a dance track. The sweat down our backs weeps for the scars of our fathers. We sons and daughter, daughters no longer display our trauma for the colonizer's inspection. May the ugly faces we make as we apply pressure to our own skin, the slight sting of reproduced percussion, palm to palm, palm to thigh, palm to heart, be their only glimpse of our past or present pain. They don't deserve our tears. Your presence here, is a blessing. Anywhere we gather is a celebration. We make endless party anthems because the joy of resistance is the system we created. Every day we mourn and we sing. The appropriator has needed our creativity and our soul from the beginning. They stole it from our foremothers and we did not have the money, credit, inroads to stop them, but now when we sing our jubilee, we will record, produce, mix, master, press, release, digitize, and monetize it ourselves. May we scat, trill, shout, and wail to the rhythm of the same heartbeats that form the drum cadence we made with our feet. Our whole body be instruments, all us together be symphony, be musical, be freedom song. And even with all their blood money, they can't reproduce it without us. Your presence here is a blessing. Anywhere we gather is a celebration. We make endless party anthems because the joy of resistance is the system we created. They will use every letter of the law they wrote to uphold their selfish mastery, to maintain it. May we resist the urge to spend all of our energy fighting them. May we fight for ourselves. May our feet dance an earthquake that shakes our broken pieces back together. May our voices shout down the walls between us, burst the sound barrier and weave our seams back together. May we feed our siblings the feast of freedom, of choice, of favor. May we savor the hot kitchen and the full plate, be it seasoned with plants from the roots of our ancestors, those whose endurance, those without whose endurance we would not exist. May we honor them with resistance to anything that oppresses. 
be us protective when it is strangers, be us forgiveness when it's our own, be us overstanding. We will never know what they sacrificed at the crossroads. Be us committed to the healing. Your presence here is a blessing. Anywhere we gather is a celebration. We make endless party anthems because the joy of resistance is the system we created. We mourn, we dance, we sing, we eat, we play, we work, we innovate, we educate, we elevate, we do it ourselves. We take back what is ours, we justify ourselves, we repair ourselves, we expect nothing from them, everything is us. Your presence here is a blessing. Anywhere we gather, is a celebration. We make endless party anthems because the joy of existence is the system we created. Thank you. No, Naja, thank you. I mean, I even though we, we have this barrier of, of the screen, I think that all of us feel like we were in the physical space with you. I mean, we are all so moved and, and full from this. Um, gosh, one, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you here is because I, I, I purchased Opal last spring, you know, this time last year, read it, bought it, like I said, for all those kiddos. And I heard you again at OCTE in the fall. I said, we, we have got to get her, you know, for afternoon. So gosh, I, I'm just, again, just, I, I do, I, I really feel blessed to, to be in this. I mean, I, I really wish we were able to do this physically, but you know, we, we just can take what, what we can get at this point. Um, like I said, I, I, I know that I speak for, um, almost everybody on this call this afternoon. We do have um, lots of comments um, that are in the chat, but uh, Tanya Crutcher, if you will just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask yours directly, and then we'll kind of um, move forward with that. But um, while Tanya is unmuting, I do want to share that um, on in several instances, Nadja has mentioned um, Koresh Lansana, and I do want to note that um, Professor Lansana will be with us on March the 24th at our Southeast um, campus. Um, he's, all, he's actually gonna do a reading there and I'm gonna co-host that with Dr. Joseph Boyne. And we will be um, giving away um, some books, just kind of keep that on your uh, radar, but uh, the conversation can, continues. And I'm very um, happy that um, Joseph wants to um, co-sponsor co this. So anyway, Tanya, um, you should be unmuted by now if you just wanna go ahead and answer your question and then we'll, we'll move on with questions. Thank you so much, Nadja. Thank you so much. We're full, we are. Ms. Naja, thank you so much. I'm I'm a little bit choked up by by that poem. I I admit, so uh, <clears throat> get myself together and ask my question. Uh, let me first introduce myself. I'm Tanya Crutcher, and I'm the executive president for the African American Student Association. And uh, this semester, I am part of a forensic speech uh, debate team. Mm -hmm. I'm preparing a speech now uh, regarding critical race theory and why that should be supported. So my question is actually twofold. Um, at the, you are the first educator that I'm actually speaking to and, and asking the question, why do you feel that it is so important for this curriculum to be taught to young students? And how would you handle any negative backlash or um, I would say micro microaggressions from administrators or uh, families of students who oppose the, the curriculum being taught. So don't let me forget to come back to the second question. <laughs> um, so 
the thing that has been the problem with critical race theory and this all this this media storm about critical race theory is that for the most part it's not what anyone's actually teaching right um we so as an English teacher, the lesson is, what's the theme of this text? What was the author's perspective in this text? Things like that, right? Even in history, what were the what were the political implications of you know this battle, this war, right? But unfortunately, sometimes the political implications of the battle were people wanted to have slaves so that they didn't have to do their own work right um and that just is what it is but nobody is putting the lesson on their board that says like today's lesson students is white people are the problem like that's that's not the lesson that's never been the lesson and so i think that's part of the misnomer of what we have going on is like the implied or the the end that you get to the the thoughts that you might walk away from a lesson thinking after learning that one of the five reasons for this battle or or this thing was racism is that dang i have to wonder why did white people hate us so much doesn't mean that the teacher was standing up there telling the kids to hate white people. Like, I don't know who decided that's what we were doing because that's never what anybody was ever doing. So that's first, it's like, that's just not what's going on. Secondly, I just feel like we've got to hold ourselves accountable and we've got to hold our nation accountable. Uh, what we, what I did just finish teaching was the Holocaust. We read the book Thief in my class, which is a really thick, long book. And now, and then we've done some nonfiction about um, the Holocaust. And I was talking to my best friend who's Jewish. And I was like, why are people so comfortable talking about the Holocaust and so uncomfortable talking about Black history. And she said, oh, well, that's easy. That's because Germany pretty immediately was like, the Holocaust was terrible. We suck. We're sorry. That was awful. And America doesn't like to take responsibility for its sins. And I was like, oh, you're right. That's it. <laughs> that's exactly why. Um, accountability. And if we look at culture, Americans have a problem with accountability in general, which is why the cancel culture situation is such a big deal because really all cancel culture, cancel culture shines a light on account accountability, whether wherever you stand on the on the issue. I've talked about it on social media several times. Um, the team Q and I used to be on together. He's still on it. I had to step away. Um, we've had several public conversations about cancel culture. It's about accountability people do not want to be held accountable for their actions. And communities can't exist without accountability. That, that just can't happen because you have to make amends when you do wrong. You have to fix situations. Like if, if you break something, you have to fix it. If you, you know, or replace it or pay it back. And, and we don't want to, Americans don't want to. Um, I think that one of the solutions potentially is just like, get your eye off of America and look at the rest of the world, because globally, people are not afraid of accountability. It's, it's an American problem. Um, so what do we say to people who don't want it taught? I don't know if that's hard. I'm scared too. Um, but I think where we start is by asking why, by at, like, I think we start with questions. I think, I think if we, if we go with questions, pointed questions, empathetic questions, so that, that's all part of it too, right? If we don't have empathy, and so angry Black people is a whole thing. I'm, I'm here for it because I get angry a lot, and anger is my go-to emotion, but if we don't have empathy for people, even white people, well-meaning woke white folks, even them, if we don't have empathy for people, 
we can't build bridges. There can't be community without empathy either. And so I think pointed questions, empathetic questions, what, what is the actual problem here? Are you afraid? What, and then, and then make, let them answer. We, we don't give people space to answer questions. Teachers are bad at that. We give too many. We, we don't let kids learn because we're giving them the answer instead of waiting for them to answer. Um, and then space, space, space and questions. Why keep asking why, keep asking why, keep asking why, and keep making them answer. Because I think eventually they're not going to have an answer. And when they don't have an answer is when we're like, right, that's why we got to do it. Okay, thank you so much. That that was brilliantly <laughs> articulated. So I actually, I, I think I'll have another premise to add to uh, my speech. And uh, like I said, you're the first educator that I've actually spoken to and asked that particular question. So thank you so much. Thank you. I hope it was helpful. I really enjoyed this. Uh, your, your soul just speaks. Your soul, it just, it just speaks. But as a, as a mother um, who really loved Langston Hughes, and you were reminding me of some of Langston Hughes' poems as you were reading, uh, I, I would love to hear a piece by you. And I want you to really think about this if you don't have one already, to write about your vulnerability about talking about this fear you have in this diverse area of, of protecting, not wanting to, to have anything with these children that are like your audience that feels like you're using critical race theory. You know, that if you would lean into that piece, I bet it would be so powerful because I, I, I sense your vulnerability, but I know it's in there. I know that piece is in there and I, I can't wait to hear it when you're ready to write about that. I cannot wait to hear it. So I just wanna encourage you with that piece. Uh, your, the realness of your poetry, I think even that can just be so, so much, it can propel others to really think about what that fear is. Mm -hmm. But also I, 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 when I'm listening to you talk about that, I say, I hear you saying there's gonna be grace and space. I hope so, I really hope so, mm -hmm. I really hope so. I, it, it's really just centered on uh not wanting bad PR at, at this juncture of my mm -hmm. life like this is not the moment I feel like for bad PR mm -hmm. um I if we're being straight up I want to I want to sell books I want to sell I want to I want to to continue to build on this platform of of being an educator and being a writer that people want to hear and so you know Oklahoma teacher teaches critical race theory is like yeah, yeah. that I want you know well when you're ready i want to hear that piece <laughs> thank you thank you uh hey, day. oh good go day okay uh thank you for the poetry it was very inspiring and definitely emotional it touched the souls you can definitely feel the how much you invest in in writing those poems definitely comes from somewhere very deep and personal as well. Uh, my question was, you talk a little bit about the why of poetry, but I want to know what was your why when you really got invested in this career as teaching poetry and being a spoken artist and writing about it and also involved with that hip hop that you keep bringing back because as the new generation that hip hop keep us in, but uh, in the past, we didn't feel like it was poetry, but then as we study more about it, we realize it's spoken word too. If you take off the music and the rhyme, you listen to the to lyric, because I'm a really lyric person. When I listen to the lyric, I'm like, this is beautiful without the beat. So I really want to know what was your wild that inspired you to keep the fight and keep teaching about it? And my second question is, have you ever considered teaching college classes, even online? Because people like me, I'm a scientist freak. But in middle school, we did learn about poetry, but I learned, I studied in the European system, which was in French, and 
the reason why I gave up on my artistic side is they made us believe that we have to put in so much work. It has to rhyme. It has to be big vocabulary. It has to be this. And I'm the person that I think scientifically, I have to have the numbers. I have to have the solution. I'm done. I don't have the time to have all that process of looking for things that are so complex to make something rhyme. So how do you inspire people like us to embrace the artistic side again? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your question. Thank you for introducing me. Um, so my why is twofold. My grandfather says that I am a writer because I was alone too much as a child. Um, I also think that um, I, I think that it came naturally. Like I think that it's just in me and I think I was conditioned towards it and it just is cool, right? Like I'm not, I'm not an athlete. I think that I just love music and I love words. I, I used to want to be a singer. And so I think, cause I couldn't be a singer, but maybe I could be a songwriter. And I think that's why I leaned toward hip hop and I leaned toward spoken word. Cause I still am performing and I still am, I still am writing, uh, just not I don't have the vocal range. I don't, and I don't have to have the vocal range. Right. Um, and so that, that was it. I think music, my friend, BD man, speaking of hip hop, BD man is also a rapper. Um, he says, music isn't everything. It's the only thing. So even as a writer, like, yes, music isn't everything. It's the only thing. Um, and, and my, is it Edward Mabry? I can't remember who, but the musicality of words. I'll never forget that phrase. Like I think about that all the time. I have a poem called Jazz in my in my first book. Um, I think about that all the time as I as I write, as I craft, like, am I being true to the musicality of words? And so that's why I said in the beginning, it's not that I don't care about it sounding beautiful. It I want it to sound beautiful. I just want it to sound beautiful and also have a point. I want both things, right? Um, and in terms of teaching university, yes, absolutely. Um, I will be hopefully finished with my master's degree in December. I'll be finished with my courses in May. And then I have a thesis to write and defend. And then as soon as somebody wants to hire me, I want to be hired. So I am here for it. Um, yes, I want to. Love it. Well, thank you. Yeah, that actually uh, concludes our session for today, but that does not conclude our, you know, thought processes and, you know, where we want to take this and, you know, what we want to read. We are so appreciative, again, that you took the time to be with us uh, this afternoon for Afternoons. Um, I just want to remind everybody that next Thursday actually concludes this year's series, and we will have Dr. David Surratt, who is the VP at the University of Oklahoma, and he oversees the Norman and Tulsa campuses. And we just want to, you know, have everybody, you know, spread the love and to be safe out there. Um, you know, there's still stuff going around and we want to make sure that, you know, we keep our hearts and our minds um, healthy throughout this time. So again, thank you very much, everybody, and have a good rest of the day. Thank y'all so much for being here. I really, truly appreciate it. it. Made my day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.